Welcome this morning. Thanks for your presence on this special Sunday when we remember our Lord and his last supper. Our call to worship from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin, 
you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the rich tradition of gathering your people together, uh, both in the Old Testament times at the feasts and then in the synagogues, and now in what we call church, the gathering of your people on a weekly basis to celebrate, indeed, your resurrection. And on this morning, as we contemplate the death that took place before that resurrection, we pray that it would enter into our hearts the depths of the suffering and of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is uh, number 459 in your, hymn, in your hymnal if you want to open it up and follow along. And now is our opportunity for sharing time. Anyone, anyone at all wish to share? I would put a little plug in for our Wednesday night Bible study. We, we had our first one, it's on Zoom, and, uh, and uh, we had a nice group gathered together. Uh, perhaps it's a, a, bit, a bit difficult when you're relaxed in your couch to really come up with some questions or answers to, but, but I think that that will improve. Um, any other sharing at all? I think Pastor has some special news here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, two, two things, actually. First of all, uh, Tori Zachariason welcomed Oakland May uh, just this past week on Tuesday, the 26th, uh, 4 p.m. She was nine pounds, eight ounces, and uh, they are at home now resting. And so Paige continues to ask for, for prayers as they adjust to this new little one in their home. And so if you will keep them in mind. And then also I have an update from April Berkey about Kenny's condition in Yankton. And I think it'd be better if I just read it to you rather than try and summarize it. So on Friday morning, Kenny was taken by ambulance to the emergency room, as my phone changes orientation, in Freeman with diabetic ketoacidosis. His blood sugars were at 948, which is very, very high. Normal range is between 70 and 110. He was stabilized in Freeman and then transferred to the ICU at Sacred Heart Hospital in Yankton. They started him on an insulin drip and a lot of fluids. He was doing well, so Friday night they stopped the insulin drip, but his sugars began to increase and by morning they had to restart it. Currently this morning, they have taken him off the insulin drip again and his sugars are staying in the normal range by just doing insulin shots like he normally does at home. He is still struggling a lot with nausea and vomiting, and they are unsure if that is related to a stomach bug that he had beforehand, which could have contributed to him getting sick, or if it's his body still adjusting to the extreme changes in stress from the last couple of days. An exact discharge plan is unknown at this time, but we are hoping that he will be able to come home tomorrow. Prayers are requested for him to overcome this last bit of nausea and vomiting and to be able to come home soon. I am doing fine, April said, and am looking at this as a great educational tool, so a positive side. Um, Jessica is also doing well, as this has given her uninterrupted time with Grandma and Grandpa, and she has also been able to see Tori and Oakland. Thank you for all of the prayers thus far, along with texts, phone calls, and messages. It is so wonderful to have a close and supportive church family. So thank you as well for, for that. Okay, anyone else? Anything at all? Well, let's uh, then turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, the anointed Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
one who was defiled for our rebellion and crushed for our perversity, who was scorned and defiled and killed by his own people and the cruel powers of the state. While we adore Father, Spirit, and resurrected Son, help us to remember that he was once one from whom people turned their faces away in shame and disgust. As we consider the minute trials of our current situation, we feel like a torn and tired culture living in, in fear of further changes and instability. We have trusted in an upright and honorable and healthy culture and have come to know that that trust has been misplaced. We thank you for the blessing you have given our culture, but we also thank you for showing us that we should look to you and not to ourselves for truth and honor. We are saddened by the plight of the poor in our own wealthy land and around the world. Protect them from evil powers, policies, and people who would tread them down. We cry out for justice. Will you oppress the oppressors? Avenge the weak and downtrodden. Teach us as to how we can share our wealth and influence on their behalf. We thank you for precious new life and for the precious mother that brought this life into the world. We pray that you would sustain them and comfort them and encourage them, provide for them. And for Paige and the extended family as they, as they nurture and uh, help. We thank you for medical care for Kenny and uh, pray healing, recovery, uh, that he could once again eat and sustain himself and get his blood sugar into balance. We thank you for medical care. We thank you that April was able to get him that care uh, soon. We thank you for our medical care right here in our, our beautiful little town and for extended care nearby. Pray that you'd guide us throughout the week. Uh, help us to look to you for joy and fulfillment and to reach out to one another in encouragement and uh, blessing. Thank you now for this time together. May your spirit be on uh, our pastor as he shares your word with us and on each of us as we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess we now have our special music.
Our scripture is Mark 14, 12 through 26, page 537 in your pew Bible. <clears throat> and on the first day of unleavened bread, when, the sac- when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went into the city and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. Then he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink it again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Hoodertal Mennonite Church, good morning. I feel like I need some more recovery time after that, after that special music. I don't know about you, but um, something important that that song gets at. I, I knew, I know the song previously. Um, is the mystical nature of our relationship with God. That somehow the Spirit of God touches us and moves in us in ways that we can't explain. And even though I am not talking about that, this morning with communion, I am talking about a very real situation 2,000 years ago, there is still something very mystical that happens in communion something that we can't explain very well that happens between us as people and between us and God. And so I want you to know that, that even though I don't speak that in my sermon, that there, there is this aspect always to our relationship with God and each other. Good morning also, as I look at the camera up there, I try and remember to all of you watching from your homes. You are just as much here with us and we think of you often. We worship in limited forms this morning, but we earnestly await a time when our church service, when our relationships return to a sense of normalcy, when we don't have to scramble for our mask when we get out of the car and walk into the church or into school or into any number of other places. Let us pray. God of freedom and deliverance, help us remember today the sacrifice that Jesus made for the entirety of creation. A sacrifice that Jesus made on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago. Remind us anew that you have called us to take up our own crosses and sacrifice ourselves for the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated in his death and resurrection. Give us vision for this new kingdom the renewed creation that is breaking into our world all around us and how the bread and the cup, the sacraments are signposts 
And they are pointing toward this new heaven and new earth. This reality that one day will fully inhabit here. Right on our hearts, right on our minds, the promises that have been fulfilled through Jesus and give us the strength to remember and walk in those promises. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was growing up, you're going to hear this a lot. When I was growing up, which wasn't that long ago, which is probably why I bring it up a lot. As I'm sure some of you already know. But when I was growing up, I remember watching the communion plate pass by me. Wondering, of course, because everyone else was getting some, when I would get some. I don't remember the reasons that I was told I couldn't. Maybe something like, you can when you're ready. I'm not even sure when I took my first communion. Several things that I do remember learning, though not necessarily because people intended to teach them to me. I'm sure you all who are parents understand that your children pick up on a lot more than what you realize. One thing was that we did not take communion communion for granted like my Lutheran and Catholic friends. They took communion most weeks of the year because they were trying to earn their salvation, of course. When we ate the bread and drank the cup, the bread and juice were symbols only and held no additional power or benefit. They were strictly reminders, memorials of our Savior Jesus who had sacrificed his body and blood to pay the price for our sins, cleansing us from the brokenness that distorts our lives. I remember communion being very boring. Can I say that in church? Filled with long prayers and solemn faces, taking communion was a serious occasion, not something to be taken lightly. Filled with a sense of then superiority and pride when I finally could take communion, I remember taking it confidently that I was participating in the right way, or at least the way that I knew and understood it then. Now, being a part of my first communion as a participant and pastor at Hoodertal, a lot has changed, as I'm sure you know. A lot has probably changed for you when it comes to communion. Communion carries much more weight than merely the symbolic nature of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Communion is a meal, first and foremost. It includes precious time to reflect, to remember who Jesus is and how he has changed our world and our lives. It is a time to join our sisters and brothers in faith, celebrating that a new and different covenant has been ratified by the blood of Jesus. In the same way that an older covenant had been ratified by the blood of a lamb long before it. It is a solemn time as we think about the horror and the pain that Jesus endured at the hands of the Roman Empire. We also know that while the Romans and Jewish authorities were convinced that they had won, they were convinced that they had eliminated this pesky Jesus of Nazareth Little did they realize that by crowning Jesus with thorns and placing him on the throne, but not the throne in a palace, the throne of a cross, they had lost so deeply that even today kingdoms and powers still are baffled by how human suffering and nonviolence can absorb evil and oppression. Often, but not always, coming out the other side, not as the powerless, but as the dignified who show those who claim their power absolutely that life and resurrection will always have the final say. No matter how much violence tries to snuff it out. 
We celebrate in communion that through Jesus' broken body and shed blood, we participate in a different kind of kingdom, an alternate reality that embraces suffering and nonviolence so that other people, so that all people can live life fully, which was something I very much appreciated about your prayer last this morning, that how do we stand up for the downtrodden? How do we help others around us live life fully? And so for this year, 2021, we will be joining together for communion at least four times. I will be focusing on each of the four gospel texts for our communion services, of which Mark today is our first. Mark's gospel is thought to be the earliest gospel written. It is the shortest of the gospels and gives the least amount of detail surrounding Jesus' last supper with his disciples. And as is often the case in Mark's gospel, we must pay close attention to every detail because Mark does not give us additional notes to make sense of all that is happening. His concise and straightforward storytelling can often actually lead us, leave us asking more questions. And our passage this morning is true to that form. Jesus has spent the last few chapters at the temple in Jerusalem. Before the temple, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, mocking the Roman generals and Caesars that would enter the city with legions of Roman soldiers to put the people of Jerusalem in their place. Jesus enters with cloaks and palm branches laid out in his path and people shouting, Hosanna! Lord, save us. The people in and around Jerusalem by this time have heard of Jesus of Nazareth, and some come out to show their support. Jesus then walks into the temple and clears out the money changers and the animal sellers, condemning their corruption and robbery of the poor worshipers that come to Jerusalem only a few times a year to offer their ritual sacrifices. If these two events were not enough to kindle the anger and rage of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, of course, was the highest religious authority for the Jews at this time. Jesus only adds more fuel to the fire then. Jesus follows his triumphal entry and clearing of the temple with parables that are not as vague as previous ones he has told in Galilee. The authorities are fully aware of what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is calling them out and warning them that they will answer to God for what they have done. And like Eli and his sons in the book of Samuel, if you remember that story, Jesus knows that the Sanhedrin's authority is only going to stand a little while longer. And so by the time we reach our story this morning, the religious leaders have made a deal with Judas Iscariot. Judas will hand Jesus over at an ideal time when few people are around. The Passover is coming, the most significant holiday of the Jewish calendar, and the Jewish leaders know that security in Jerusalem is going to be tight. The Romans had learned by this time that they needed to beef up their military units in Jerusalem during Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Thoughts of liberation and freedom ran high during this time as people celebrated the deliverance of their ancestors from Egypt. During this season, insurrectionists and revolutionaries would come out of the woodwork and attempt to violently liberate Jerusalem, the city of God. They knew that their God would come to save them at some point as the prophets had written and promised. And Passover had to be one of those times. Or at least that's what they assumed. Therefore, the religious leaders had to be careful about arresting Jesus because the people might riot, causing the Roman military leaders to send soldiers to break up the crowds and kill whomever they needed to in order to calm, to calm the situation. 
Jesus has been spending his days in Jerusalem and then his nights in Bethany, most likely at the home of Mary and Martha. Bethany is just outside of Jerusalem. In our passage this morning, what is strange about Mark's account is that Jesus sends his disciples into Jerusalem to prepare a place to eat the Passover meal. But Mark writes, this day is the first of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Traditionally, the Passover lamb was sacrificed on the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because the Israelites would have prepared to leave Egypt, not leavening their bread, not allowing it time to raise, because their bags were packed and their shoes were on. They were ready to go. They were to burn any of the lamb left over so that they could leave right away. And if we follow Mark's timeline then, the Passover has already happened and they are taking the meal the following evening. More questions. But either way, Jesus sends his disciples into Jerusalem with specific instructions to speak with a man carrying a water jar. One of the notes in my study Bible said, most likely Jesus was talking about a man who was carrying the jar like a woman rather than traditionally how men would have carried the jar. And that would have been what had signaled to the disciples that this was the man they were supposed to talk to maybe. But again, more questions. The owner of the home where he is taking the water will have an upper room furnished and ready for Passover to be prepared. Everything happens as Jesus predicts. So the two disciples prepare the meal. And that evening, Jesus and the other disciples join them. As they are eating this roasted lamb, thinking, of course, of the first Passover, Jesus tells his disciples that one of them will betray him. Of course, then, all of this, the disciples are wondering what Jesus is talking about. Who is it? How does Jesus know? We do not get any idea in this moment how Judas responded, or even if Jesus gives him a glance, letting him know that he knows. Of course, in that moment, the disciples are all waiting for Jesus. Just tell us already. But Mark writes chapter 14 in such a way that the, leader, that the reader or listener can contrast how Jesus responds to God's calling in comparison with how everyone else responds. So if we go back to the beginning of chapter 14, Mark shows how the leading religious authorities have no intention of following God's calling or listening to Jesus' teaching. They are convinced that Jesus needs to go, showing just how far at least the leadership in Israel has strayed from God's calling. And right after that story, we hear of a woman who gives the most valuable possession she owns so that Jesus can be anointed in preparation for his suffering. Of course, then, the disciples are so blinded by their longing for power and their hope that Jesus will be taking over Jerusalem in this moment that they criticize this woman for wasting this gift because the money that it could have been sold for could have been used to give to the poor. We must contrast her response with not only the religious authorities who don't see Jesus for who he is, but then the disciples as well and Judas because Judas has decided for whatever reason to give Jesus over and we don't get much background in Mark about it. We get to our story, Jesus knows what is coming. He knows what he must do and what is going to happen this Passover night. Jesus takes the Passover meal with his disciples following the way that God has called from his home in Nazareth to the lion's den in Jerusalem. At the Passover table, Jesus warns them of the traitor among them, but he doesn't tell them who it is because he knows that by the end of the night, it won't be just Judas who left him. By the end of the night, all of his followers will have deserted him. Notice Mark's point in this whole chapter that the woman and Jesus are faithful to God's call, while the religious leaders and disciples 
all of whom are men and who claim to know God or Jesus, have missed what is right in front of them. Does this sound familiar? The upside down nature of the kingdom. So after the disciples' murmurs have quieted down about betrayal, Jesus picks up a loaf of unleavened bread, a symbol already loaded with meaning for the Jewish people. All bread during this festival was unleavened to remind them that when God called them out of Egypt, they did not have time to leaven their bread or to let it rise. God was calling them to freedom to liberation, and they had to be ready. But Jesus adds on top of another layer of meeting. After blessing and breaking this bread, he tells his disciples to take a piece. And just as the bread is broken so that they can eat and participate in Passover, so Jesus' body will be broken so that they can be free again, so that they can participate in this new kingdom just like when their ancestors were freed from Egypt. But this time, they will be free from more than just the Roman Empire. They will be free from the sin that has left them as a nation in exile. And they will be able to join fully into what Jesus is inaugurating, what Jesus has already started in his ministry. So then Jesus takes a cup from the table, gives thanks for it, and passes it among the disciples telling them that the wine they drink is his blood poured out. A rather gruesome image, actually. But this blood is of a new covenant, one that will be consummated when he is murdered on the cross like the lamb that Moses slaughtered, ratifying the covenant between God and Israel on Mount Sinai. This new covenant is different than the one that came before Jesus' entire ministry, including this supper, has shown that God's kingdom is not coming as we would expect. Whatever God is doing through Jesus, it will lead to victory and freedom as the Passover meal did. And just as God's, God liberated his people Israel from Egypt, showing that his kingdom is more powerful than the empire, than Pharaoh's empire and his armies, Jesus is showing his disciples in this new meal that his new kingdom will see its leader crowned king and enthroned on a Roman cross. That by Jesus' nonviolent sacrifice, this new covenant will bring freedom and hope and peace and love and power to not only Israel, not only Israel, but to the entire world, to all of us. Jesus adds in this solemn moment that he will not taste wine again until he drinks it anew in the kingdom of God, referring to his resurrection and his future interactions with the disciples. At this point, the disciples have got to be wondering what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus does not give them any more details, at least in Mark's account, in Mark's story. And so they sing a hymn to finish the meal and leave the city to go to the Mount of Olives. And so we take this bread, and we take this cup today, remembering Jesus and his new kingdom beginnings. We take this bread, we drink this cup also as a foreshadowing, as a look ahead to a great feast, a feast that we will enjoy together with all of the saints of God, past, present, and future. We take time today to grieve those that we have lost or who have passed on, but we earnestly look forward to a great feast and celebration with them in Jesus' presence. Finally, we take this bread and drink this cup today, knowing and proclaiming that when we eat and drink together, something transformative happens to all of us. Though we may not be taking communion in the ways that we are used to today, we remember Jesus. 
We pray his presence here among us as we eat and drink together, and we pray that we are transformed into his likeness, willing to suffer as he suffered and willing to sacrifice ourselves as Jesus did. Let us pray. God of the bread and the cup, we thank you for communion, how it reminds us of who you are and how you work in our world. Let us never forget how eating and drinking together is a gift from you, an opportunity to grow together even though we cannot participate like we might want during COVID. We look to you and the new covenant that Jesus instituted with his death and resurrection. We look forward to the day when the kingdom is fully consummated and we eat and drink together in your fullest presence. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a little strange now. I, th I thought I'd be more comfortable with it, but I think I've grown used to this sitting in front of me. I will do my best, though. Hooder Tall Church family, this supper, the Lord's Supper, is a remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ for the sin of the world, a feeding on him in faith a communion with one another in his body, the church, and an anticipation of the day when Jesus will come again. It is the Lord's Supper, and all are invited to it. Therefore, let us come to the Lord's table in faith, knowing our weakness, renouncing our sin, trusting in Christ, seeking his grace. If you will stand for this time of reflection. Before we take the body of the Lord together, before we share his life in bread and wine, we recognize the sorry things within. These we lay down in silent prayer and reflection. The words of hope we often failed to give, the prayers of kindness buried in my pride, the signs of care I argued out of sight, these we lay down in prayer and reflection. The narrowness of our vision and of our minds, the need for other folks to serve our will, and every word and silence meant to hurt, these we lay down in silent prayer and reflection. Of those around us in whom we meet our Lord, we ask their pardon and we grant them our pardon. That every contradiction to Christ's peace might be laid down in this time of silent prayer and reflection. Amen. You may be seated. Lord Jesus Christ, companion at this feast, we empty our hearts and we stretch out our hands, 
asking to meet you here in bread and wine which you lay down. Hear, hear the words of the Lord Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give them to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Let us pray. O God of perfect love, through Jesus your Son we have come to know you. In the company of the whole communion of saints we come before you in this remembrance of Jesus' death with gratitude for your redemption. We thank you that you forgive those who are repentant. You send us a friend of sinners and gave us a new covenant. With your only and beloved son's stripes, we are healed. God of mercy and grace, gratitude fills our hearts as we come to this table. Let it be a sign to us that you forgive us and accept us graciously. In this holy supper, make us one with him that we might be steadfast in following him. Send your spirit to sanctify our hearts so that we might praise our redeemer and taste his presence now and forevermore. Let the bread we break and the cup we drink be a communion of the body and blood of Christ. Hear us for his sake. And now, if you all will join me, help us to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Could the deacons please come join me up front? For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. This is my body. It is for you, broken. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Bless, O Christ, this bread that we break together. Make it the bread of our holy communion with you. Open our eyes that we might see you by faith on the cross, the reconciliation with God. May this immeasurable act of generosity for us draw us to love you and serve you always. Amen. In the same way, Jesus took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are in awe of your plan of salvation for us. Jesus, we thank you for your, your sacrifice on the cross, your shedding of blood for our sins. 
that we might be redeemed to you through faith. We thank you for giving us your spirit. Let us know and feel that mystical power. And through, through the spirits living in us, we pray that we would be filled with your peace, your joy, and your love. We thank you for this sacrifice you made for us. Amen. So then, it sounds like you all have done this format before, but we'll start with the front rows, and if you can, come forward in small groups, and we will serve communion in that format. Children are also welcome to come forward and receive a blessing, and all who confess a relationship with Jesus Christ are welcome to join us in communion. So. Broken for you, body of Christ. Broken for you. Let us eat the bread together. Yep. Blood of Christ shed for you. Maybe.
Chad's got me on. I tell you what, I love that guy. Blessed are you, O God. You set aside this bread and cup as signs of your son's broken body. As signs of your son's shed blood. Through them, you have made us partakers of Christ and of one another. As we go forth, give us grace to count others better than ourselves, to love our enemies, and to seek peace. Send the spirit of truth to keep alive in us what Jesus taught and did. In whose name we pray. Amen.
First of all, thanks to Amy. Um, we all search for beauty, and uh, you brought that again this morning into our other uh, company us in, in church here that, uh, that bless us with music. Uh, there's a benevolent fund offering today uh, that's played in the foyer, and our regular offering is also in the foyer. And just a note, there are two, Mary and John, that, that count the offering, and it's helpful to them uh, if they can get started on that. And so uh, if you don't mind you know, putting it there, if you're comfortable as you come in, uh, and if you choose to tarry, in the sanctuary here, which is also welcome, uh, please get your offering uh, out there and then come back in and visit. So we'll have a blessing for the offering this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for the ultimate gift. There's no greater gift than to lay down your life for your friends. Help us to know uh, how to bless you uh, with, our, with our offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. will stand for the benediction. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, Jesus Christ. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us the strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Jesus our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.